quality and 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 getting universal education and many people might say well kindergarten is too young to start that but well when do you start it when do you start talking about you are responsible for making the choices that you are making and you need to start making those choices today when you're five years old what have I neglected to ask you that bears mentioning at this juncture there's several things because we we change we're not we're not static human beings so we talk a little bit about why I believe in doing something and why did I start what transformed me what time did I become a transformational leader and then there's the other piece which a lot of us believe in which is I have a 17 year I have a 16 year old son and on a daily basis I worry am I doing enough to make sure that some crazy person doesn't press that bomb is he going to have a life is he going to have children and are his children going to have children am I doing enough to guarantee that that's going to happen and that's the question that that I wake up to every day I mean that's 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 what haunts me am I doing enough thank you so much for the interview you've been very kind and gracious it's been a pleasure thank you Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me today, Vielka. Can you please tell me your full name, uh, the position you occupy, and briefly how you ended up in that position? My name is Vielka McFarlane. I am the founder and chief executive officer of Celerity Educational Group. And um, the several years ago, about not too long ago, 20 years ago or so, 20 something years ago, um, I decided to go into education because I wanted to work exactly here in South Los Angeles, serving the, the children of black and brown children um, who were the most at risk and receiving the worst quality educational services anywhere. And um, work with the school district for a very long time until I realized that I really would never be able to change their reality, their future, uh, or, or anything, bring anything that was quality to them. And so I decided to just break away from the system and create an organization that was 100% committed to producing quality service or providing them a quality education. Where were you born? Uh, where'd you grow up? And please tell me briefly about your family of origin. I grew up in Panama. Uh, Panama is in Central America. I was there until I until my 20th birthday when I came to the United States. Um, did not speak a word of English, and so, and did not have documentation. And um, I went through the same plight um, of most immigrants who come to this country, um, not knowing where to go, living in in the inner city, not having access to jobs, not having access to education, and thus my passion for working explicitly only with in, in the inner city. Please tell me about your post-secondary education. Mm. I um, went to um, a vocational school, so I need to say that to begin with. My secondary education was a vocational school. I was trained to be a secretary because back then that was, I only knew one woman in, in my neighborhood who worked, had her own money, and she was a secretary. And um, once I graduated there, I went to college in Panama and I studied international relations um, to be a diplomat. And then I came to the United States to-, to Did you graduate from that school? I did not graduate. I left uh, Panama in my third year 
of international relations and came to the United States with the dream of going to UCLA um, to become an economist. And what degrees do you hold? Um, I have I hold a bachelor's of science degree in economics um, from Cal State LA, close enough, <laughs> <laughs> same city. And um, then I have a teaching credential of uh, from uh, Cal State LA also. Um, a master's degree in school school administration from um, National University, and I'm writing my dissertation um, for Pepperdine, Pepperdine University in organizational leadership. Um, basically, my style of leadership is transformational leadership, and um, I believe very much in servant leadership. Why did you study education originally? Um, because education is transformational. Um, it, it, my, my parents, my dad got to sixth grade in elementary school and my mom got to fourth grade in elementary school and they were the most, the highest educated in their family. And my dad and my mom were smart enough to realize that the only thing that would change their children's future was education. And so I, I drank the Kool-Aid, I believed it. Um, and um, now I'm trying to, I'm committed to- I love that expression, by the way. <laughs> uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm committed to make sure that um, uh, as many children and as many communities as I can touch are able to be able to transform themselves. And hopefully it's a domino effect. What expansion plans do you have for the future? <laughs> we are very, we believe that changing 20 kids or 100 kids. Today we we work um, in 11 different communities and we're educating 3,000 students. But that is not enough. I mean, it's not even a, a ripple. It's in, a drop in the, in the bucket. Yeah. And so we we want to work throughout the entire United States and hopefully in these seven continents. What's the mission of Celerity? In order for us to go into our community, there has to be several things going into play. First all of the schools, both elementary and middle schools in that community, um, are failing. And they're failing um, not only in terms of regular uh, test scores, but they're also failing in terms of educating the children. Graduation rates. Graduation rates, rates attendance rates, dropout rates, all of that stuff. That's it. That's only the first component. The second part, the second thing that needs to be in place in addition to that, there has to be a high crime rate. Um, and the third component has to be that there is very high levels of unemployment and um, welfare participation. And the reason for that is if our mission is to transform communities, then there's no point in going into a community that doesn't need to be transformed. What one or two or three things are you doing that's working best? Everybody has f formulas. And then you have the ones that are, are here that everybody sees, and then you have the ones that are under here that are not necessarily politically correct, so you don't really say it. And so, but I think that what works best for us is no excuses. Um, you mean the child, you don't allow the child to have an excuse, that's what you mean? Yes, so, okay, you come from a broken home, so sorry, but, what are you going to do about it? You know, you have X problem, B problem, Z problem. If we, if we were an organization that <clears throat> enables people to continue to be exploited, or if your organization enables people to continue to be ill-educated, or I think that, that, that poverty begets poverty begets poverty. And there, there's, for instance, no accident that in these neighborhoods there's no libraries, there are no tennis courts, there's no access. Parks. There, there are no parks. There's basketball hoops, plenty of liquor stores, and all the liquor stores take um, uh, the EFTs. And so I, I think that is, is, you know, like it or not, I mean, I believe that it's designed that way on purpose. And so, yes, you come from this community. If I say, oh, poor kid, he doesn't need to do this work, and he doesn't need to learn that because he's a poor kid, or he's an abused kid, or he comes from a broken home, or whatever, whatever. You're guaranteeing whatever. his grandchildren will also be. 
bingo exactly so we're very tough and we take no prisoners when it comes to that is it we believe that everything in life is about choices and the sooner you learn that this the better it is how do i give you the tools to break that uh, what do we call it uh, that expectation of your failure what things are you doing that increase the likelihood of this child being successful we make sure that we help them understand what are the mechanisms that are keeping them down and guaranteeing that they will always be poor and we help them take responsibility for making a choice of deferring gratification and working towards transforming themselves and their communities into successful communities. Are there statistics or results that you can point at in, that in an objective way show your success? All of our schools are in inner city communities that our schools are failing. All of our schools are performing either within the top 3% in the state or the top 12% in the state. We range from 3% to top 12%. Um, that is... Um, and these are the same kids that were attending schools that were about to have their charter revoked by the federal government? Uh, yes, or they were attending schools that were uh, public schools that were absolutely failing, yes. What you're doing is basically trying to break the cycle of low expectations. Yes, absolutely. Break the cycle of low expectations. And teach delayed gratification to achieve success. Teach delayed gratification to achieve success, that's correct. Why aren't those two things done everywhere? It is not politically correct. It is not politically correct to tell um, a child or a person of color um, you have the power, you have a choice, even you always have a choice, even when you have a gun to your head, you have a choice. Why would they allow the quiet bigotry of low expectations to force failure on their children? I think that the problem is, is that our communities are disempowered and they think that they don't have choices and there, thus every few years you see riots but unfortunately the riots happen within their own neighborhoods yeah they didn't come and burn cars in my neighborhood no they don't because they don't have access and they don't know many of these people don't go outside of you know a one mile radius or a few blocks radius from their houses all of your schools are currently k through eight is that correct that is correct so you have a kid that's rocking and rolling they're you know they're getting good grades they're capture they're performing at or above grade level and now you release them to one of the failing high schools in the neighborhood what happens to them we do not do that we so make sure that our students are transferred or they get into to schools that will continue to unless the parents choose to put them there but we make sure that all of our kids get transferred to schools that um, want to continue and enroll them into college we um this is our first year in which our first cycle of students are getting receiving their uh, college uh, acceptance letters and so we're getting the updates almost on a daily basis of where they're going how far they're going how many schools are accepting them and them having the luxury to say oh yeah northern arizona accepting me i don't know if i'm going to go because i'm considering x other school or 20 other schools so it feels good. It's like the same situation that my own children are in, mm -hmm. where they have multiple acceptance letters and they get to decide where they want to go. Yes. What does the education system in the U.S. most need now? We need to stop asking the union bosses permission to educate kids. You'd say we need that more than we need increased funding. Yes. How much do you get per pupil per year from the state of California? We get about $5,100 per pupil per year from the state of California. Do you have other funding sources? Yes, we have some federal funds that we receive, so that's about another $2,000 per pupil. And then we also uh, go out and seek grants from private sources, but that's a hit and miss. Like who? who who's given you a good grant lately? Mm, we get grants from the Walton Foundation. Uh, we have Walton as in Walmart. Yes, Walton as in Walmart. 
um, there's big supporters. So in the last 12, in the last six months, we're getting about a million dollars from Walmart. Great. In order to give a child the kind of education that you or I would want for our child, how much money do you need per pupil per year? Mm. In order to give a child a, a good quality education, it world would be class, world class education, about ten thousand dollars per year. Why should the taxpayers of the United States fund educating your kids to that high world class level? Um, I think that the best way for me to say it is, it's about <clears throat> making sure that the United States does not become a third world country. So you think that if we allow significant portions of our population, even though they may be primarily